I happened to see a DevOps talk a month ago, which was titled Unit Test Your Java Architecture. And I found that to be super interesting because unit testing is something that I've always attributed to code and something more objective, like, okay, is a code working fine or not? And architecture has always been a little more subjective in my mind. It is a little more soft and a little less concrete. So the idea of unit testing architecture I found to be very intriguing. So I listened to this talk by Roland Weiss Leder. Did I get that right? Yeah, perfect. All right, awesome. So this is about a framework called Arc Unit. I wasn't familiar with that. So I found this talk to be really interesting. I will paste a link to the stock in this description so that he can check it out. And I reached out to Roland and asked him if he'd be you know, interested in, in sharing some of his experiences with our unit to us. And uh, Roland was kind enough to agree. So I have with us Roland. Hi, Roland. How are you doing? Hi. I'm fine. How are you? I am <clears throat> doing very well, too. Really excited to have you with us. I wanted to start out our conversation by asking you about how you got into ArcUnit. Like, what, what was there a specific problem that you were trying to solve, and you went, okay, let's let's explore what are the options available, and you landed on ArcUnit, or did you look at ArcUnit and try to see, you know, where it would fit? Like, can you talk about your journey of how you discovered ArcUnit? That's a good question, actually, because. Um, the first, I think I discovered Arc units after the first beta release, maybe that is maybe seven, eight years ago. And I think I found it somewhere on Twitter or GitHub or somewhere. And I thought, hmm, this looks like, um, simple framework to first to test your Java architecture, but also to query your Java code, like you would use the Java reflection API. And mm. the idea to query your Java code with an API that is basically like the Java reflection API was, wow, that's cool. And I'm not really sure if I need it right now to test my Java code, but it came always to it came always again over several years and i started to integrate it in nearly every project i used and interesting it's still fascinating me that you can you yeah, analyze your java code with a simple java library so you've been using this for like seven years which is which is quite a lot um yeah from time to time i'm not really sure if it's really seven years old, but the beta phase from 0 0.4 and 0 0.5 and so on was really long. And I think just last year in summer, they released the first 1.0.0 release. Mm. So they are finally at the point where they say, this is how it should work and how you should work with it. Okay. Have you had any experience working on ArcUnit? Are you primarily like a, a user of it? I'm primarily a user of ArcUnit, but I also contributed some changes or enhancement to that. For example, that you can query the new Java records with ArcUnit that came with Java 14, I think, hmm. and some small enhancements and bug fixes. Interesting. But most of the time I'm ArcUnit user and I like to talk and share about ArcUnit, but to show other people how great this library actually is. Okay, I think that's a good segue into looking at what, what ArcUnit is. Like and folks in the audience are probably interested, in, like what, what what can it do? Again, testing architecture seems like a very vague thing. So maybe we can start like if you could talk about what is ArcUnit and why would somebody want to consider using ArcUnit for their Java projects? Firstly, ArcUnit itself defines itself as a small free Java library to unit test your architecture, like I said in my conference talk title. And 
the goal is or does so by checking dependencies between code units like packages, classes, or methods, or simply two code units. And what we can test with ArcUnit, I want to show with a little demo. For that, I created a small example. For this example, I used the Spring Pet Clinic. For those who are not familiar with that, it's a simple example application to demonstrate how to use Spring Boot and how to build web applications with Spring Boot. And in this application, we have two distinct modules, the owner, the pet owner and his pets and the vet who works at this pet clinic. And when we open the package, we, for example, see that we have several controllers that accept the HTTP requests. And we have something that maybe look like JPA entities or repositories to interact with the database. So this looks like a typical layered architecture where we have the controller on top and we go down to some business layer and down to the database. Hmm. And the first thing is when we see we open the package and we see actually what is the controller. It looks like every class that ends with controller. And if we go deeper in this class, we see ah, it's actually annotated with the controller annotation from Spring. And for example, to make these classes easy to discover, we can say all our controllers that are annotated with this annotation should also have a name that contains controller. And with our unit, we can now define this in a simple unit test. It looks like if you're familiar with JUnit, J -unit, it looks a bit like a JUnit test, but instead it has an arc test annotation. And arc rule definition. Definition dot classes. And we simply start with an entry point in the API, which is called classes. And now I can say classes that are annotated with controller should have name ending with controller. This is basically our first art unit test, what we can use. Query single classes and look if they are defined in the way we want them to be defined. And I can now use my IDE and say run the demo arc unit tests. And after a couple of milliseconds, well, it's a bit longer than I expected. It says we have a green test because all our controllers are well defined. Okay. But so when you when you call classes, you're as, asking ArcUnit to get its own representation of <clears throat> mm -hmm. all the classes in the project, and then you're asking it to kind of perform certain tests on yeah. the classes or the structure itself, right? So here it just happens to be a certain naming convention and an annotation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So basically, we define our rule with with a kind of fluent API, as you saw, I just mm -hmm. can hit dot and IntelliJ or Eclipse or whatever IDE you use suggests where, where to go next. For example, I can query names or annotations or types or whatever. As you see, the scroll bar gets longer and longer. So the fluent API can guide us to define our architecture rules. And behind the scenes, we have ArcUnit, which analyzes all our classes and executes the rule we defined here against all these classes. 
This is basically how Arc Unit works. Okay. The first reaction that I had when you were you were demoing this was this seems more like a, a linting rule rather than an architecture rule. Because here what you're doing is you're saying, here are rules for my syntax and how things need to be, as opposed to architecture, which is more of like interconnection between different parts of your application. And that's where you gave the second demo, which was about having these different classes call each other. And to be honest, that was where the the power of ArcUnit really struck me. It was like, okay, you can you can establish rules about what part of your code needs to be able to call or should not call what other parts of your code. And can, can you talk about it's kind of like a it, it's it's a spectrum, right? So this seems like a uh, a lint rule which is localized to a certain point, which is not so mm -hmm. much architecture, I would I would argue, as opposed to this other example, which is architecture. Do you agree? Yeah, of course, because we can define def a very broad range of architecture rules here, which are maybe just rules. Maybe these are really about the architecture. But most of the time I use architecture uh, arc unit to validate the structure of the code itself itself may it be the architecture how different modules interact with or just how these classes are really structured hmm. um, to show your audience the second test you mentioned i opened another class with some architecture tests that i prepared and you define I defined a rule to test the dependencies between several modules. For example, that I can say the owner and the vet, these two, these two domain modules should not interact with each other. That I, this I could define like classes that reside in a package called something dot owner dot something should not depend on classes reside in a package something dot vet dot something and also the, the other way around so that I can test how these packages or modules depend on each other or that they do not depend on each other. Interesting. So depend on classes here implies, you know, it should not have like a member variable, which is of that type. Or you know, or it should not have any references to the class, which is of that type. Is that is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I'm in the vet package, I should not call any code that's in the owner package. And if I do that, Arc Unit will fail and provides me a good error message. Ah, there in the vet repository, you are calling the constructor of the owner, for example. Hmm. And this is where things are going to be very different from the linting thing as well, right? Because if you mm -hmm. take something like Sonar Cube, I don't know if you can do stuff like this. I don't. Do you have experience with Sonar Cube? You know, if this yeah, can be done. I used it in several projects, and I also saw a GitHub issue for Arc Unit to integrate into Sonar Cube. But I think these two tools are on a different level. From what I see is that Sonar Cube looks into our code to validate, for example, if we have proper null checks or something like that, or yeah, how a class is defined that they have consistent naming, for example. But ArcUnit is, is meant to check dependencies between two code units, so it's one level above Sonar Cube, I would say. Okay, so is it fair to say SonarCube is more localized and looking at a class on mm -hmm. its own and reporting on it, whereas ArcUnit is kind of like looking at the whole project architecture yeah. and trying to identify dependencies and relationships and trying to mm -hmm. establish rules for those. Yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. Did you have any other demo plan? Because I have a few questions about kind of like the philosophy of ArcUnit itself. I want to get your thoughts behind it. Is, is there anything else that you wanted to share in terms of the code? Let me see. For example, 
first I mentioned the, well, in this test we tested that the modules are depend on each other or do not depend on each other. So it's more like the domain modules. Mm -hmm. We can also test architectural patterns like we have a layered architecture where we have the controller, we have the service layer, and we have the persistence layer. This is what this test basically does. For example, it says we have a layer, we have a layered architecture here. And this consists of three layers, the controller, the domain, and the persistence. And we can define how is the controller layer defined. Well, these are all classes that are annotated with controller, for example. Or we can say the domain, these are all classes that are assignable to Java data, Spring Data Repository. Mm. Or everything the, from the persistence layer is annotated with Jakarta persistence entity. And then we can say, or we can define how this layer may access each other. For example, the controller layer should not be accessed by our code because it gets invoked from the framework. The domain layer should only be accessed by the controller, but not from the persistence layer. And the persistence layer on the bottom may be accessed by all the layers above so that we can have the layers from the access between the layers from top to bottom, but not the way up. And with, with this simple rule, we can test our whole application if the layered architecture is defined in our whole code base. This is pretty cool. And I can imagine this doesn't have to be just for like the, the, the three tier layers that we typically attribute the word layer to. You can essentially create any number of layers for subsets of your, of your architecture. You can say, okay, this is my, this is a certain domain and I'm going to assign it to a certain layer. And you can reuse those layers as well because it's kind of like a runtime entity here. So you can, ima I can imagine having like a utility class, which which gets a layer and then uses it in multiple test files and go, okay, this is my X layer. And these are the rules that it needs to have with Y layer and with A layer and B layer and so on, right? This is really powerful. Can you talk about what are some rules that you typically tend to add in your Java projects when you use something like ArcUnit? The, the, this itself is, is pretty useful, right? You don't want your controller method, anything that's in your controller layer to be accessed by your service layer or your repository layer. You need that one single direction of flow. Mm -hmm. But apart from this, like what are some common rules that you see generally applying to your projects using ArcUnit? If I put both of these tests back to the screen, from what I see it's, or well, what I typically add to project is one of those two rules, either that I check the dependencies between modules or that I check the dependencies between layers. Because mm. most of the project I saw is that at least some architectural separation is also done on the build management level. So if we have, for example, a Maven project, then sometimes these Maven modules are also built on domain specific modules and in one or in each module, I would test if this, of, if these layers are correctly defined. Or what I also see sometimes is that the Maven modules are structured by layers. So that I have a layer with the controllers and then I have a layer with all the domain logic and then I have a layer with all the persistent logic. And in this case, I would test that all these domain, domain specific modules are dependent or not dependent on each other. This is something I typically start with. Okay. Okay. What do you think about like when you, so the way I'm understanding this is it, when you use the word architecture, you usually mean this kind of like interplay of different modules mm 
perhaps different microservices to farm an overall system, right? When, when you bring our unit into the picture, you're not so much testing the interplay between different runtime entities. It is more of the architecture given one runtime entity, like given one microservice or given one code base, really, whether it could translate to, you know, one or more runtime instances. Is that fair? Like you're not you're not looking at it at like a whole system level. It is given a component of the system which translates to a code base. This evaluates rules of architecture for that unit. Is that fair? I think that's fair to say. Yeah, that I only test one runtime of a or one your yeah, one runtime of one service or something that runs in a single JVM, for example. Mm. Okay. The, this brings up a related question, which is about microservices. Typically, a large enterprise Java application consists of multiple microservices, and they usually tend to have this architecture drift over time. I've noticed, like, you know, one architect builds okay, you have to leave these 10 microservices and you have these rules and all that stuff. But then as different teams start working on it, these microservices start to drift apart. You can easily tell, okay, this team worked on this stuff, this team worked on this, so there are some differences here and it, and it tends to happen. So but when I heard of Arc, you know, it was like, hey, this is a great idea to kind of consolidate everything so that you have these rules which apply to all these microservices. But then I went, well, hang on. These rules also reside in those individual projects. So you have microservices A and B. Microservice A has certain ARC unit rules. Microservice B has certain ARC unit rules. So the same factors which lead to this drifting apart of these things might also apply to the ARC unit tests. So first of all, you know, I'm curious to know what has your experience been with these disparate code projects that perhaps need the same architecture rules? And how do you see ArcUnit applied to a microservice architecture which have these multiple code bases or multiple projects? Maybe on a conceptual level, I would first say the beauty of microservices is that each team or each service can have a different architecture so that you're not bound to global architecture rules. So every team is free to build each service in the way they want them to build them. But on the other side, it's rather straight or it's rather okay to say all microservices should be in, should be built in the same way and should follow the same rules. And the challenge is to provide the same rules to all these services or projects. And ArcUnit has something built in that we can use. For this example, I opened another demo I created for a conference talk. What you can also do is to provide a dedicated library with all units or with all architecture rules. For example, I created here a library with common architecture rules for my demo project and this contains some some general coding rules like we don't want to use log4j or we don't want to use standard streams like system out or e.print stack trace or throw new runtime exception or something like that uh, this is not part of the standard streams but this could also be a common coding rule. And then I have, for example, rules how to use JPA, or I have rules how to build the service layer in my application or in all my services. Mm. And on the other way, on the other side, I have my service, which has an architecture test. And here I say, I have my architecture and I want to, I want ArcUnit to execute all tests, all arc, arc tests that are defined in my common library. 
if I go to this rule, I can have that I have a list of my coding rules and service rules and persistence rules and JPA rules. And ArcUnit then scans all these test classes and sees, ah, there is this arc tests in and goes into this class and scans all arc tests and goes deeper and deeper and deeper until it finds all arc rules. And this is a way to provide a simple Java library, for example, as simple Maven project or Raven project and provide this library to all other teams that they can use it in their services. And the only thing they have to do is create this single test class and it has all rules that they need or all rules that they should execute. So this is essentially solve that problem. You define perhaps the architect of an organization defines these rules in one place. And then whenever you spin up a new microservice, you kind of pull in those rules and, and test it. While still, like you said, at the same time, you have the flexibility of potentially having certain microservices deviate from the rules, because that's the benefit, if you will, of microservices after all. On a related topic, the other question that I had was about who writes the stuff? Because, you know, usually you look at like a junior developer who is only concerned with just getting the thing to work. And mm -hmm. they have to they have to follow these rules will be set by possibly senior developers or architects. So in your experience, have you seen like the architects define those rules or and constantly maintain those rules? And then these projects pull in the rules and then apply it so that whenever like other developers or perhaps somebody who is not aware of those rules break them, it kind of catches it right away so that it doesn't leak into the to the code base. Like, how do you see people working on these rules versus applying those rules? Most of the time, the oh, the ownership, I think, for these architecture rules should be for the complete teams. So they maintain the rules for themselves. And what I see is that there's always that one guy that cares actually about the architecture. And this is the guy or the one who writes and maintains these architecture rules. And most of the time I am that guy in the project. <laughs> nice. I hope you don't get a lot of hate for it because, you know, test breaking is always a painful process for, for <laughs> developers. It's like, yeah, I got the code working, but still my test fails because of some rules. Like it can potentially be painful, but it's, it's for the greater good, as they say. Yeah. Another question that I had was about these, you know, if I think back to my experience, maybe 10 years back, people are a lot more serious about architecture, I think, than they are today. We, there used to be this big formal process of like, you got to make everything right because code bases tend to live for a long time. And there was this, people were okay with that investment to architecture, to consistency and all that. But these days there seems to be this trend of, okay, let's, let's move fast. Let's not think too much about architecture. Let's build these small things and, and, and just get things working and then we'll figure this out. There was this quote that you mentioned in in your talk. I think it was it was from Wagner, the or Bruckner, which which is about like I have this here. Whoever wishes to build high towers must spend much time near the foundation, right? Which is which makes a lot of sense, and that was kind of like the the motto of architecture and large Java applications five years back and ten years back. But these days, what I notice is people aren't building large towers right away. People are building a lot of small towers and it's it almost seems okay for them to not spend so much time on the foundations. Like, let's get these small towers working. And then after that, like once we've proved out a concept or whatever, then we're gonna build a larger tower. So I'm curious to see if you feel like ArcUnit it seems more like a a longer term strategy than something that you start out doing. Like when you start out, you don't want to think about architecture. I don't know if people even write unit 
minutes <laughs> for their code. It's mostly just getting things to work. And once they have something there, then they bring in ArcUnit to establish longer term consistency. I just want to get your thoughts behind it. Do you see that as a trend or do you see people getting into ArcUnit right away? I also see that in projects that they start building something and maybe have rough architecture in mind. So for example, we have these, these and these modules and they should work with each other. And we have maybe a Spring Boot on bottom and we have a database and let's get this to work. And when the application grows and the code base grows, then sometimes it happens that the code gets something of a mess that we have like something like spaghetti code, but also they realize we need to get the structure back into the system. And this is the power of ArcUnit, I think, to show you the current architecture violations you have once you define the architecture rules you want to fulfill. Okay. Do you, do you see this happening in the in the developer flow, or is it more of a CI CD concern? Um, okay, so imagine you're working on the code base, right? Do you uh, let's say you finish some changes? Do you run your Arc unit tests before you post a PR? Like, what's what's the workflow for you? Good question. Because the Arc unit tests are like normal J unit tests, for example, they are just part of the unit test suite. And maybe I execute them and maybe the CI CD environment executes them for me and punishes me with failing tests if I did something wrong. Yeah, you, you wouldn't know related tests as well, because unlike unit tests, which is localized, with arc unit tests, you never know, right? You might, you might make a change in your module which might break a rule which is somewhere else right there isn't like a one-to-one -one mapping between a piece of code and an arc unit test so i guess you would have to run everything so i guess ci is probably like a like a safer way to make sure everything runs you might have to do your best effort in running it locally unless you want to run the whole thing but the beauty of arc unit is also that it can execute these Arc unit tests really fast because it has to analyze all the code base only once and the execution of the tests itself is rather quick, like just like unit tests in a couple of milliseconds. So actually it would be a good idea to execute it with all the other unit tests as well because they are part of the unit test suite itself. So mm. it really depends on the developer workflow. Can you talk about onboarding ArcUnit to a project? Let's say somebody is, you know, some of our listeners are already interested in ArcUnit and they want to bring ArcUnit into a project. That can seem daunting because, you know, anytime you bring in something like this, there are probably going to be like 100 violations on a decently sized Java project. So what would your recommendation be for somebody who is considering bringing in ArcUnit? Like, you know, do you have any advice or tips? Like how would somebody go about doing that? The good thing first is that adding ArcUnit to your code base is just one additional dependency. For example, the ArcUnit core is one jar with maybe logging framework behind that and that's all. But as you say, bringing it into an established code base mm, might lead to hundreds of violations because the code is not always structured like the rules say so. But ArcUnit is prepared for this and therefore I have to share my screen again. And mm, for example, let's say we defined this architecture rule that we want that all our requests that modify our data should print some log messages so that we can later see in the log file what was changed on which point of time. And so basically we want logging in our system is the 
most common architecture rule. And as and I defined here in my as a as arc unit rule, for example, methods that are annotated with post mapping. Again, an annotation from Spring. Everything that is a post request, for example, should log. But what logging means is for example, we should call methods on a SLF4J logger class. In this case, we also see that if the ArcUnit API does not provide the rule you want to write, you can just write your own condition in this case. Right. And if I go to some post mapping method, this one has five lines and we can see there's no logging at all. So, mm -hmm. and if I open the find again, we have four other mappings as well that also do not log. So adding this rule would lead to five violations. And to get this unit test green, we have to fix all those violations, which is for five methods, it's okay and to do in maybe five minutes but if we have hundreds of violations which contain several broken dependencies it will take you five weeks to fix all those dependencies for example and the idea is ArcUnit brings a mechanism mechanism that it's called freezing that you can say i freeze the current state of violations and say i know these violations exist but for the current time, I will just ignore these violations to let the test fail. If I execute these tests, I have the controller should lock. Takes a moment. And the test is still green, but I don't have, mm, but at least one method does not fulfill this rule. But what ArcUnit did or what I prepared before is that there is a list of frozen violations that is also committed with your code base in your Git repository, for example, that says, ah, we have, we have several violations, for example, the method owner controller process creation form does not log and when ArcUnit finds this violation it does not fail the test but it ignores this specific violation when I okay so a freeze takes in the same kind of validation that you would normally assert for but instead of having a violation report as a, a red error, it instead says, okay, I'm make, kind of making a check and I'm kind of remembering what are all the violations and it'll still result in green, but then it saves it to this file. So anytime you run it again, it checks if this violation was already recorded in the frozen file. If mm -hmm. it is, then it will not report it. Yeah. But wouldn't that require you to remove the freeze? Because every time a freeze runs, isn't it updating this file? For example, if I add a new violation to my code because I add a new post mapping method. Okay. Let's say do something. This method does nothing but is a post mapping method and it should lock now and I added new code to the code base and that's clearly violating our rule, mm -hmm. then we will see that the test fails with exactly one violation, namely the, where is, there it is. Namely the do something method does not lock. So with the freezing mechanism, when we introduce it, we can freeze all the current violations that so that these tests so that these violations do not fail the test but we when we add a new violation to the code base then these new violations will be reported 
Ah, interesting. So h- how does how does freeze know? Is it the presence of the file? Like for example, if I if I delete that frozen file and I run this again, it'll take this new introduced method as a previous violation and then any new stuff from there on is going to get tracked. Is that, is that how it works? The presence of the file? Yeah, that the violation is present in this file, then it is ignored basically. But this text file here with the frozen violations is more like a to-do list so that you can go and see ah, the owner controller process creation for method currently has no logging. And when I introduce logging into this method, I can remove this line and commit the changes to Git. And from now on, this method would cause new violations if we have violations in there. Right. And the there the, the thing that I don't quite understand, Roland, is the last time freeze ran, it mm-hmm. looked at all the existing violations mm-hmm. and it saved it to file. Mm-hmm. That freeze line hasn't been removed from the code yet. It's still there and it's still executing. But this time, it doesn't look at all the existing violations in the code and write it to file. It's comparing what is in the frozen file with the present violations. So my question is, is this influenced by the presence of this file? The last time the freeze ran, this file didn't exist. So it created the file and then it recorded all the violations. The second time it ran, since the file exists, it doesn't record all violations, it's comparing. Is that is that right? Is my understanding right? Yeah, that's correct. On the first okay. run, when you introduce the freezing, ArcUnit checks if the file exists, and if not, it will create the file with all current violations. And on each run after that, it will see, ah, the file exists, so these are the frozen rules. And everything else should lead to a vi- should lead to a violation. Yeah. Arc unit to a project, and there are like a gazillion violations. Right. You can yeah. you can freeze it and then try and prevent new violations from coming up. While at the same time, like you said, this becomes a to do list. Right. You can gradually gradually solve for it. A follow-up question I had about freeze is, once somebody has frozen the violations, is there a need for the freeze word to be there or can they just remove it because the violations already exist in the in the text file? From what I know is that the freeze in the Java code, you will need that this freezing mechanism works and that it compares with the text file. But once you solved all these violations, then you could remove the freezing itself from the code base in the rules. But it has, okay. I think it has to be present so that it checks the text file and the violations. Gotcha. All right. Cool, cool, cool. But while, while you were showing your code, I had one follow-up question that I know some from, some from my audience would be interested in it. There was this complexity thing, not related to ArcUnit, but if you don't mind, could you share? Is, is there like a plugin that you use to, you know, check the complexity? The complexity is the method complexity that that shows up in IntelliJ. Let's see if we can have it somewhere here. This All one. right, there it is. Complexity six. Can you talk about what what plugin you use for that, and how you use uh, it? Let me see. It is. I think it's the code metrics plugin, which basically oh. computes the complexity of a method and of a whole class. For example, if you have an if statement, then you have two paths through this mm. method for one if, it, if the if is true and one if the if is false. So it's basically two ways through the method. And if you have a cool. complex condition like a and B, then you have more ways through the code and the code gets more complex. And this plugins just show how complex the actual method or class itself is. Do you do you ever do anything with it? Like it says complexity is six, it's time to do something. Have you ever had that motivate you to do something? <laughs> or is it more like a like an FYI kind of a thing? <laughs> 
I actually installed this plugin maybe two weeks ago or so. And <laughs> okay. When it says it's time to do something on the class level, it's really strange. But if it's on a method level and you, it says there is a complexity of 14, then I, and I'm currently working on that method, I try to find a way to make this less complex. That's fair. And That's fair. more understandable. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your your experience, what you do currently, and what are you passionate about as a Java developer? Kind of more of we're moving away from ArcUnit to trying to understand a little bit more about Roland as a as a Java developer. Like, can you tell me a little bit about your background and what you do? I'm currently working as freelancer, as freelance software developer. So. I'm going from developer team to developer team and helping making or bringing their legacy Java systems into the future. That's basically what I do. And most of the time it's structuring code and untangled or removing the complexity, like with the complexity mm. plugin, or remove all the spaghetti code that is building uh, hard to understand code, but also introducing test automation or unit tests to a code base, because sometimes the code is rather hard to understand and not so well documented and unit tests, maybe there are someone, there's someone who wrote some tests, but projects I see that are, they are not so well structured as you would think. And mm. this is the, this are some of the tasks I regularly do as freelance Java developer. With that in mind, I can see how ArcUnit would be really useful for you. Like you can, you can kind of set up guardrails so that the complexity doesn't increase. And as, mm. as mm. people work on it, you can continue to reduce the complexity and enforce more rules. Can you tell me about what you mean by moving legacy code to the future? Like, how would you define future in this case? Basically, Paul, what I'm trying to do is make the code understandable and maintainable for the rest of the developers and future developers of the project. By, yeah, understandable and maintainable, because when I look into when I open a random class and go into a random method that is long and long and long, it's quite hard for me as someone who does not know the code base, what's really going on. Hmm. And I can imagine it's the same experience for other developers and especially for junior developers who start in the project. And yeah, that's one of my main goals to make to rework or work on the code base to make it more maintainable and easy to understand. And also to say, ah, this code is so obvious that there are obviously no bugs in it. So it also involves writing tests to show that it really works like it should. Can I ask you something about, about freelancing itself? You, you tell me if you don't want to answer this, but I have I've always been in like a, a salaried nine to five job. Like I've never done freelancing. And the prospect of freelancing has always scared me because I quite like the the security of a, a regular paycheck. I'm curious to know if you've tried like a, a salaried position or a full-time position and compared to freelancing, what do you think are the are the pros and cons? I'm guessing you prefer freelancing because that's what you're doing right now. I'd love to get your thoughts behind like compare, comparing those two, especially if you've done like a, a full-time role before. Before I started freelancing two years ago, I was also in a nine to five job as full-time developer and that for more than 10 years in the same team. Wow. So, Okay. That's not quite common these days, I think. And the benefit of being a freelancer is that you can see different teams on different projects and different technologies so that you can mm. 
learn something new every day, I think. It's also with regular salary jobs, but there you have mostly always the same project and you build on top of that new features of Xbox and maintain your project. But the cool thing about being a freelancer is that you can go from project to project and see uh, different things. And that was one of the main reasons I switched my role. I think the the maximum learning you do is when you when you start working on a new project, right? Like the first month or so is where your your learning peaks, and then after that, you do you do tend to learn, but not so much. So it kind of gradually the curve gradually flattens. What what, what how about like what do you think are the drawbacks? Because for me, honestly, the I like I quite like the the security of having like a regular job and the thing that worries me with freelancing is like okay I have to I have to keep finding the next gig and this is true for mm-hmm. contract work as well it's like I have to find the next gig and I don't know where it's going to come and there might be portions of time where I'm just searching and I don't have anything to work on do you feel that or is it not a concern for you yeah Finding the next project to work on is, I think, it's the biggest challenge being a freelancer. But the beauty on the Java ecosystem is that there are so many Java projects there that looking for Java developers, so running out of projects is not so risky in this case. But I'm especially looking into projects that do not build the next new big thing but maintaining legacy projects which is quite a bit harder to find projects for right but yeah there's there should be a lot of those challenge. though right yeah legacy projects yeah. are probably more in number than <laughs> building the next big thing mm-hmm. so especially when you say you're somebody who can who can clean up a lot of old stuff people would probably welcome you because that's mm-hmm. that's like a hard thing to do anyway right? most of the time i work in projects i do not add so much code but i delete very much <laughs> code <laughs> yeah yeah removal of code is underrated it's yeah i think the most productive days are those where i delete thousands lines of java code yeah because they are too complex and i not need it anymore what are some other tools you use or other frameworks or libraries you use like ArcUnit, which makes it easy? Again, deleting code in a large legacy project can be a scary prospect because often it's like, you know, at best, nothing changes, right? You're not affecting any functionality. And at worst, you've broken something significant. Mm-hmm. So people tend to go like, okay, why not risk it? Let's leave it there. You don't know what will break <laughs> if you delete something. So I'm curious to know your process. How how do you go about deleting code? Like, do you have tools like ArcUnit, which kind of helps you? Or is it more like, do you have a process behind it? It's basically just the features of IntelliJ that I use. So the IDE that I use from day to day and it shows hints this code is unused you can delete it and if you save delete something then it checks is this method used somewhere else and it says oh it's not safe to delete the method and yeah and teddy j is really good in supporting my life as as i'm working on legacy code and i'm not getting paid by teddy j for saying that (laughs) All right. How about when you have multiple code bases, though? IntelliJ is useful when you're working on... I, I'm guessing legacy code would probably imply monolithic code bases most of the time, right? Because they wouldn't have modernized it to microservices. Do you see that as the common thing you work on? Like, what if you have... I think for all the drawbacks of a monolith, the call patterns are navigable, like you said, with IntelliJ, whereas with microservices, it's hard to tell, like who is calling what, when is something being mm. used. So do you find your work being more in the in the former category where, you know, IntelliJ can potentially help you as opposed to certain modern systems where it cannot? 
because most of the time I'm working in such monolithic projects where everything is connected by Java API calls, so it's rather easy to use the IDE to navigate through all these call hierarchy stacks. Hmm, interesting. I have so many questions. Of this was this wasn't what I'd planned to ask, but the, the <laughs> fact that you're working on modernizing legacy systems is is very interesting because I don't know. We we as Java developers get get a bad rap for being slow in terms of adopting new technologies, very conservative in terms of modernizing our stack. So you're doing something which people wouldn't normally consider as as glamorous work, but it is it is work that needs to be done. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and it's very important as well. You're kind of paving the way for more glamorous work to be done. On a related question, like, w how do you see the usages of newer versions of Java? Is that a part of your modernization strategy? I keep hearing a lot of people getting stuck in the older versions of Java, like there are a lot of Java 8 users still. W what has your experience been with Java versions? I'm currently in a project where we moved from Java 8 to Java 11 end of last year. And I saw another project where they moved this year from Java 11 to Java 17. So there's a broad range from using Java 8. And I have also a project where I'm stuck to Java 8 because of the runtime environment mm -hmm. up to newer Java versions. So we have a really broad range and I would like to use the new Java features more often. How about modules though? Is module like if you somebody has moved past Java 9, have people started using modules so much? It didn't get a lot of good reception initially. Like mm -hmm. people were interested in the other features, but they didn't really weren't that excited about modularity. What has your experience been so far? I've never seen the Java module system in a real life project so far. But I think the main goal for the Java module system was to modularize the JDK itself. And as a side effect that you can also use it for your own application. But hmm. using it, but using build tools like Maven or Gradle is normally enough in your Java projects, I would say. All right. This was, this was very interesting. I'm actually excited to try out RQNet in my in some of my projects and see what what value I can generate from it. Do you have any recommendations for for any typical rules that people tend to use? Like is there like a, a library of some things that you know you can adopt? Or is it more like each project, you know, you figure out based on what you need? That's a typical question after after my arc unit talks. Is there a common set of rules that I can start using. Yeah. ArcUnit itself provides some very general rules itself. For example, the layered architecture I showed in the beginning, but also these general coding rules like do not use system.out.println or e.print stack trace, for example. This are some very general rules that are predefined and there are libraries with predefined rules. The one is the J molecules project, which has the goal that you can provide or that you can define architectural concepts directly in your productive code, not in a test code, mm. but in the productive code that you can say the package or example service is part of the service layer so that you can annotate the Java package with the annotation service layer and J molecules then provides arc unit rules to check if the layers are correctly defined so that the persistence layer does not call the service layer hmm. so that you have the documentation aspect as well in your productive code. This is also a set of predefined libraries. That's interesting. I'm not sure how I feel about that because on the one hand, yes, it provides documentation, but on the other hand, I don't want 
that to be a point of failure. Like if somebody forgets to add that layer to the code, the test is never going to catch it. So I quite like yeah. the idea of the rule being defined separate from the code. So, you know, even if somebody were to make a mistake in terms of adding the right annotation, you can still infer it from like package rules or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting that it's there so that at least as like, you know, where it works, documentation would be a good, good idea. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So I think in terms of rules, you would say, look at the J molecule library mm -hmm. to identify some, some common rules. Mm -hmm. Okay. And beside that, I think every project is different and so should, and each project should have arc unit rules or architecture rules that fit the application itself that you're working on. I think we are at the end of our talk. Thank you so much, Roland, for spending your uh, time with us and walking us through arc unit and also talking about yes. your, your experiences in general. Thank um, you for inviting me. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to have you again. And yeah, thank you. I hope you have a good, good day. You too. Thank you.